Merry Christmas to you. We are glad that you are checking in and participating in worship, maybe on this Christmas morning for you. So if you're new, I'm Pastor Josh, and I don't know how many will watch this. I don't know how many people on Christmas Day will, um, will attend church. I think so many people are going to be here on Christmas Eve, uh, but uh, I am just we are providing this for you ahead of time, and it's my delight, honestly, week in and week out, to open up God's word together. We have been in the book of Isaiah over the course of this Advent season, listening into what this Old Testament prophet had to say about the promise of the Messiah. But today, since it's Christmas Day, I want to start with Matthew 1. So if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. And it is Christmas. This is worth reading once again, Matthew 1, 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Thanks to the Lord for this, his word. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, once again we enter into a time of just considering your word, just soaking in the story of how much you love us and how you have uh, intervened and entered in. You are not distant. You are, you are with us. God with us. And so we simply praise you for that today. Guide us as we think together in Jesus' name. Amen. This Christmas, we have all our girls home, 100% of them, all four of them and uh, my oldest daughter's husband with them. We have all of them together and at home. They are with us, and that brings us joy. The way Wendy likes to say it is, they're breathing Eagle River air. <laughs> like, even if they are out with friends and they aren't in the home proper with us, uh, they're breathing Eagle River air. Our girls are with us, and we are very aware of their presence. The close and personal presence of our loved ones is significant. That's why Christmas is worth celebrating year in and year out. Jesus has, has come. He is Emmanuel. God is with us, and we are aware of his presence. At least that is the goal, to practice his presence. And that's the simple title of this Christmas morning message Presence. That's the good news that the Matthew passage declares parenthetically. Emmanuel means God with us. So turn with me now to Isaiah 41, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And I want to warn you on this Christmas morning, what we're about to read is going to sound a little bit random for a Christmas morning. It's talking about God judging the nations and their idolatry and God choosing Israel as his people. And I'm going to read it, and you're going to say, huh? I think, right away. You're going to say, huh? But the most encouraging part is that God is with us. And that's the promise of Christmas. And so here's the plan. I want to share three Christmas encouragements to you based on Isaiah 41. The first is that God is in control, and we see that in verses 1 through 7. The second is that God has chosen a people. We see that in verses 8 to 9. And the last and the most important for us today is that God is with us. And we see that in verse 10. And at the end, I just want to conclude 
with a call to practice an awareness of the presence of God as we move into 2023. But first, follow along as I read this passage, Isaiah 41, verses 1 through 10. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. The islands have seen it and fear. The ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. They help each other and they say to their companions, be strong. The metal worker encourages the goldsmith and the one who smooths with the hammer spurs on the one who strikes the anvil. One says of the welding, it is good. The other nails down the idol so it will not topple. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, You descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Thanks again to the Lord for this, his word. All right. Our first encouragement this Christmas is this. God is in control. God is in control. That's the whole point of this prophecy in Isaiah. It's that God is in control. It starts in verse 1 with the opening words of a court proceeding. Be silent before me, it says. Be silent before me, you islands. Those words in Hebrew are like the equivalent of a bailiff's words in our courts of law today. Before the judge enters, we would hear something like, all rise. The court of general sessions, 17th judicial circuit is now in session. The honorable judge Robert Jones is presiding. And then everyone would remain standing until the judge takes his seat, at which point the bailiff would say, please be seated. Those are the opening words of a court proceeding in our land. And then the proceedings would begin with the opening statements. That's what we hear in this opening verse. And God is the judge. He is in control. It is he who silences those he wishes and in contrast allows others to speak. According to verse 1, it is he who lets them come forward and speak. And then in verse 2, we learn that it is he who has stirred up one from the east. And we learn over the course of the other chapters that Isaiah is prophesying about a real king in the ancient world that would rise up about 100 years after Isaiah was writing. He is prophesying about King Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia. After God's people were defeated by the Babylonians and taken away into exile, King Cyrus would defeat the Babylonians and render a new edict that allowed God's people to return to Israel. Historically, this is known as the Edict of Restoration. There is a royal proclamation attested to archaeologically in a cylinder seal that was discovered. Cyrus was a real person. Isaiah was prophesying about a real king. And friends, God is in control. And we read in this passage that God literally anointed Cyrus for this task. He reigned about 30 years. And while he was not a follower of the Lord, he was used by the Lord. God is in control. Listen again to verse 4. Who has done this and carried it through? Calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am am he. 
the passage goes on to describe metal workers making idols with gold and nailing it down so it doesn't topple. Our broken and sinful tendencies inevitably lead us away from the living God to do things like this, and it sounds ridiculous to our ears today, but we do similar things. It would be laughable if it weren't so sad. But alas, God is in control. Chuck Cervenka is a Wisconsin pastor. He's, a, he's an acquaintance, a friend of mine. He was actually the one that uh, oversaw my ordination council a number of years ago. He's a pastor in southern Wisconsin. He wrote a book entitled Sanctuary in Time. And he said this about our dynamic of human sinfulness and our poor choices and God's ability to work anything for his glory. So many times, God gets the blame for the consequences that come from our choices to disregard his desires. Because of our poor choices, things happen every moment that are outside of the desires that God has revealed for us. Thankfully, because he is ultimately sovereign over everything, God takes each of those instances and uses them to make happen what he wants to accomplish according to his sovereign will. In other words, we're, we're still responsible for our choices, but thankfully, God is in control. He has always been in control. He was in control way back in Isaiah's time, predicting King Cyrus the Great, and he was in control when he predicted the ultimate king, Jesus the Messiah. He's in control today. I just need to say that on this Christmas 2022. God is in control today. He's orchestrating and using the leaders of our day for his purposes, for his glory. And he's in control in our lives, working in our lives because he knows us and he loves us. So that's just the first encouragement on this Christmas morning. God is in control. The next is this. God has chosen a people. That's verses 8 and 9. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners. I called you. I said, you are my servant. I am have chosen you and have not rejected you. God has chosen a people. That was a promise initially to a very specific people, a tribe and a nation, the Hebrew people of Israel. But it has now been fulfilled in Christ for any who would believe, for all who would put their faith in Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 3, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. What this means for us is that today, when we affirm that God has chosen a people, it means those of us who rely on faith in Christ are blessed along with Abraham. We are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. We are a people. God has chosen a people. We have been chosen. God wants us. We are a chosen people. I don't know if you had the experience in grade school, in gym class, or at recess of, of a pickup game of basketball, or soccer, or, or volleyball, or whatever it is, and two captains being selected and then those captains from the group of people choosing their teams. And I don't know if you were one of like uh, the few that was just always chosen first and kind of the exalted nature of that role. Or if you were one of those that, that was almost always consistently last. I, I kind of waffled in between those. I was fairly tall when I was a kid, so I got chosen uh, a lot right away, and then they realized I wasn't quite as good as I looked like I was. And once that got out, I was chosen a little bit later. No matter what, what it is, it's a special thing to be chosen. 
That's the name of the new series, by the way, that it focuses on Jesus' ministry, the chosen. Friends, I believe that God's heart is for anyone who would say yes. That's what I believe. 1 Timothy 2, 4 indicates that he wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And when we do respond to our Lord, we affirm that we are among the chosen. God has chosen a people. And one last thing about this. To be chosen means to be his servant, which is repeated a couple of times in verses 8 and 9. In verse 8, it says, but you, Israel, my servant. And then in verse 9, uh, it says, I said, you are my servant. Uh, the title God's servant is a really honorable title. It was a title used of Moses and of David and of the prophets. It assumes complete trust and submission and obedience. I've been thinking a lot lately about obedience and what it means for us in whatever scenario we're in in our life, whether it's a relationship that's coming to a close or a relationship that's beginning or it's a work environment or it's our family or it's whatever it is. I've been thinking a lot about obedience. And because I was reading my friend's book this week, Chuck Cervanka, I'm gonna quote another passage from him. Um, he kind of talks about this dynamic of obedience and submission as God's chosen people this way. Our will needs to align with his moral will daily. It is the prayer of Jesus in Luke twenty two forty two: thy will be done. Praying for God's will to be done is the key for joyful submission. As we begin to truly seek God's will, we are in fact beginning to align our will with his. Friends, I think this is so important for us as we close out this year and look to a new one. And we're gonna get to more details and encouragements about this in a minute, but I believe this is one of the biggest keys for us in our community of faith in 2023. Simple trust and obedience. Hearts that desire to align our will with his. And we do that more and more when we identify as his people. God has chosen a people. All right, last encouragement this Christmas. God is with us. Listen, listen to verse 10. This verse is really why we're focusing on this passage today. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Just listen to that verse one more time. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Friends, as God's chosen people, we do not need to be afraid. No matter what, God was with his people then. They had failed. They had been exiled. Uh, there's this picture of them uh, finally returning and a promise of God's character. Even in the midst of their discipline, God was with them. And friends, God is with us. Jesus goes with us always. He's Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Our God has pledged a relationship with us. He is more loyal than anyone else on earth, past, present, or future, the most loyal. As we read this passage in the context of the failure of God's people, we can't help but sense God's love for us as his people and his deepest desire to encourage us to trust him for the future. God is with us. That's the reality of Christmas. That's the reality of the ascension of Christ. God's presence bookends the story of Christ. It's there It is birth in Matthew 2 when Jesus is referred to as Emmanuel, which means God with us. And it's there in the last chapter, in the last words of Matthew, I will be with you always, Jesus says. God is with us. 
And my heart for us this year is that that would be our guiding pursuit. So, allow me to conclude with just a number of thoughts that have risen to the surface for me as I've prayed about this message and this Christmas and studied a little bit. Thoughts about the presence of God and the Holy Spirit and and seeking him in our lives and in community and, and in his word. First, a question. What would happen if we more regularly and consistently gave our full attention to what God is doing in and around us and sought to respond in faith? What would happen if we more regularly and consistently gave our full attention to what God is doing in us and around us and then sought to respond in faith? My heart for you and for me this coming year is that we would choose to cultivate a deeper relationship with God. To recognize that God is in control, that he has chosen a people, and that he is with us, Emmanuel, God with us. My heart for you and me this coming year is to practice an awareness of the presence of God. It would be that we would, my hope would be that we would pray to increase our awareness of God in the midst of our life experiences and then fully surrender to an obedience to his will. That we just know when we say yes to him by faith, it means that we are saying yes to him and his will for our lives, his moral will for our lives, his direction for us. That we would be a people paying attention together to God's personal communication to us. That we would be a people that would be growing in intimacy with God and and living out the consequences of that relationship, that we would be a people discerning the presence and work of God's spirit. That's my hope for us. That's my hope for myself. That's my commitment to the Lord is is to not make these words just sermon words, Sunday words, Christmas words. It's, it's to continue to make them life words in our day-to-day existence. And I believe that Christian friendship for us is going to be so important in the year ahead. This process of listening and discerning, it's one of the greatest gifts that God uh, gives us. It's to be able to sit with another brother or sister in Christ who may intentionally set aside all that is on their plate for just a while and attend to what God is doing in our lives. And that we might be able to do that with them. And that vice versa, it goes back and forth. Attending to what God is doing in each other's lives. I believe God acts in every area of our lives. That he's present in our marriages, our our families, our friendships, our work and our working relationships, our hobbies and our downtimes. God is present in every area of our lives. God is there in our doubt as well as our certainty, in our weakness as well as our wholeness. Our call is to accept God's presence in all areas of our lives, practice an awareness of, uh, awareness of his presence, to commit ourselves to be 100% honest with him and to be willing to trust in the transforming power of God's love for us in Jesus Christ, who we celebrate at Christmas and ultimately his work on the cross. Just trust him. Just trust him. One last quote. This is from a Christian leader named S.D. Gordon in the early 1900s. He said this, so many of our lives have become a badly tangled skein of threads. God, with infinite patience and skill, is at work untangling and bringing the best possible out of the tangle. He could oftentimes do more and do it in much less time if our human wills were more pliant to his. He can be trusted. And of course, trust means trust in the darkest dark where you cannot see. 
So friends, would you trust God? Would you enter into that journey of trusting God with me this year? We have come through some dark times this past year. I anticipate there will be more in the coming year. God's light shines in the midst of that, and there's times of joy and and wonder as well. Our call is to trust God through all of it. Our only hope, our best hope, our shining hope is God's presence in Christ. And so, on this Christmas morning, that's our focus. It's to remember Jesus at Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us. It's to remember the nature, the character of our God from promises like this in Isaiah. Let's commit to seek him, to trust him, to follow him from the inside out from now into eternity. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, oh, we need you. And on this Christmas morning, as a number of us are going to be opening presents and celebrating your birth by being together with family, uh, Lord, there are opportunities for us to practice your presence in the midst of all of that. May we not get so distracted with the pointers, the, the, the things that point to you, and may we be enamored with you, your presence, your glory, your love for us. Um, we worship you. We, we, we say happy birthday to Jesus on, on this day, and we recognize our need for you. Thank you today for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, we love you. We're grateful to God for you. Thank you for tuning in to this time in God's word. God bless you and Merry Christmas.